you and I together. We were scenes in a past life. We were, we were definitely Greeks in a past life. Hello and welcome to World Awake TV. Your host and holistic hacker here, Sky Cubby, beaming in from Los Angeles, California, with none other than David Avocado Wolf. We're going to have just an amazing, you know, we always have amazing conversations. And uh, I'm really excited to invite you into this one. So, David, welcome to the show. Awesome. Awesome to be here with you, Sky. Yeah, we were just in Hawaii. Yes. And uh, what's life been like after Hawaii? I came back from Hawaii and went to California, Miami, Colorado, and then San Francisco. And I got a message from Carlos Santana and his wife, Cindy Santana. And they, they wanted us to come down to Las Vegas. They want to talk about a shaman's conference that they want to host in Las Vegas. And they wanted some ideas about how to set it up and organize it. So we flew down there. My mom lives in Las Vegas, so that was a really wonderful chance to see my mom again. And my mom came. So we, we met with the Santanas, and, and we had a wonderful time. What wonderful people. I mean, absolutely the best people ever. That's and, amazing. And then, uh, yeah. and then we went to the show. So uh, basically the best ever. It was the best ever. I mean, that's what I love about this guy is uh, <laughs> life is always the best ever. And when it's not the best ever, it's the best ever by far. And, uh, you know, except there's times when you go up against the beast, like when you dealt with this thing with Monsanto. And, uh, you know, life isn't always the best ever, but it seems like it whenever I'm around you. So we're going to get into later on some tips on how you can live your life the best ever. So I'm really looking forward to dropping into that. Awesome. But, uh, you know, we also want to get into some cutting edge health and wellness stuff because this guy brings it. And, uh, you know, we should just do things right here. I mean, yeah, let's get uh, some chocolate. Yeah, on. Let's get some chocolate because. Uh, and I see you're, you got beans, you got freshly dried beans. This is something for that, the, that the people, the folks at home should see. This is, you know, freshly dried cacao nuts. You know, it's, we call them beans, but it's really a nut. This is the most widely eaten nut in the world that no one ever eats. Right. We've all eaten like. You know, just imagine if I came to you every day and I said, oh, here's almond powder, here's almond butter, here's almond oil. And then one day I actually came up with an almond. You know what I mean? Like 20 years later, here's your actual almond. That's, That's kind of what things are like with chocolate. It's like this is the actual food that all chocolate. You get the idea. And so just to have access to the original and tune into what this, what it really is. Um, these are, from, are these from your farm? This is two days ago. I harvested the pod, banged them on the counter. Put them in the oven overnight on the lowest setting, and when we got that, it's a pretty good cultivar. That's pretty good. And um, that tastes like Hawaii. Yeah, I research with cacao, and also learning from you. Whenever there was an incredible event, um, a wedding, uh, you know, something special going on, they initiated it with with chocolate. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna open one of our CBD bars here, and, um, and we'll initiate this correctly. Oh, I'm a, let's, can we show that to everybody? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's just see that whole bar. Look at that. You guys can see, yeah, there you can. You can pick up the relief on this chocolate bar. This guy can appreciate chocolate. I mean, you, you have to understand, David is the reason we have a wall of chocolate when you go into Whole Foods, I, I believe. <laughs> Thanks. But, mm. um, oh, this is good. Pretty good. Wow, great job, man. And we put in some of the um, mm. superfoods, mucuna, mm. ashwagandha, chlorella, spirulina. You want to okay. tell them what mucuna does? Okay. The blind? Macuna and chocolate have been eaten together for longer than chocolate and vanilla have been eaten together. Macuna is like your ultimate anti-stimulant. So if you have a stimulant like chocolate or coffee, you want something in there that's going to balance it off. Mm -hmm. Real popular today is this idea of having your coffee with MCT oil right? Right. or coconut oil. And why is that? Well, it just, it's just softens the blow of the stimulants. But really, if you wanted to get real herbal about it, we always want something in that coffee or in the chocolate or in our hot chocolate that's an anti-stimulant that's going to actually have the exact opposite effect so you don't get too stimulated, too jilted, you don't get too much of a rush, you don't get too much of a, of a you know, head spin. And that substance had been macuna in the Amazon for 10,000 years. And that's what they traditionally mix with chocolate with, and vanilla came along later. Now I grew all three of those together. Oh man. Vanilla, macuna, and cacao. All, they we grow, got we some together. vanilla vine growing on some of the cacao. But nice. It's amazing the cacao shamans knew what they was They know. Because right, we don't realize what we've lost. Mm -hmm. We don't realize the knowledge we've lost. But we can regain it quickly. That's the thing. That's the thing about the modern age. We can get it back fast because our book learning allows us to have accelerated learning. Right? 
We can learn from books. We can also learn from video. We can also learn from the internet. There's just so many ways we can take the information in now and catch up. David, you refer to yourself as infopreneur, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because it's, you know, it's all accessible to us, but uh, people like David go and they find the information and they bring it to the people. I know that uh, you've, you've helped thousands and thousands of people um, with, with their health and wellness, and you started with a lot of these superfoods and nutrient-dense foods and, and getting people onto the consciousness that the sun is coming through. Actually, your company was named Sun Foods. Yeah because it's sun energy that the plants transform and give us exactly what we need. Now that's, that's pretty amazing. And now you've actually transformed, changed into getting the body, getting the message out that we need to detox more because that just allows more nutrients in. Is that the main? That's the main idea. It's actually detoxification. We live in a toxic world. I was reading right before I came in the room here today, I was reading that Xanax is in 70% of the blood donated today. I was like, are you kidding? This is Newsweek magazine. This is mainstream stuff. I was like, this is nuts. Xanax? I mean... It's like our water system filled with all pharma, the farms. Pharm yeah, pharmaceuticals and drug. I mean, like, the water system in, in London is filled with heroin, cocaine, every drug, that every recreational drug you can think of. And so... We live in a toxic world. I mean, that's just, you know, we're, we're in L.A. right now. You go out on this highway right here, you're breathing in brake dust. You're breathing in automobile exhaust. These are some of the worst carcinogens going. So we don't, we, it's so normal to us, we don't think about it. So my recommendation is, is first step, you want to get healthy. Even if you are already, you're already healthy, you want to start thinking about detoxification because the research on detoxification in animals is conclusive. Animals that regularly detoxify themselves, for example, that are fed activated charcoal regularly, mm -hmm. live longer, and they live substantially longer. In fact, they live longer than if you fed them superfoods. So when did you first get tuned into the, the uh, benefits of activated charcoal? It all happened backwards. It was just I completely fell into it backwards. Because you always knew about it. I always knew about activated charcoal, and I'd take it if you know if you took you ate something, and you know you're at some like raw food restaurant or something, and there you know it's obviously not cooked, so there could be a bacteria in there, and you're thinking, you know, something's not sitting right. You take the activated right. charcoal, and it just stops it, right? That's the whole thing about activated charcoal. It was charcoal. always something we did out of uh, you know, if you have an emergency, if you're starting to feel bad, if you drank something, uh -huh. ate something bad, you're like, oh, the charcoal. Why don't it? Because it absorbs all the stuff, but uh, it does a lot more than that. Uh -huh. right? And there's an interesting thing there because we think it absorbs like a sponge. Mm. It doesn't absorb. It's an adsorbent mm. with, with a D, not a B. Yeah. And that's an interesting distinction. It's electromagnetic. It's electrochemical. So charcoal, I, got, I fell into it because I have a friend of mine, she contacted me and she said, have you heard of this stuff, the carbon 60? Mm. And I was like, this is like five years ago. I was like, I don't know what that is. Tell me what it is. She started laying out this whole thing, and I said, send me a website. So it's been a website, and boom, there's the study, the famous Fathi Musa 2012 study about how they had increased the lifespan of animals, by they doubled the lifespan of animals in a toxicology study. So they were basically taking this little fraction of what's in activated charcoal, carbon-60, and they had doubled the lifespan of animals. Incredible. Accidentally. Well, I remember hearing about that. Right? It was like an accident. And, and this is big oh, yeah. news. Yeah. Yeah, this is big news across all sciences. It's just, it was an amazing thing. And what ended up happening I mean, is, yeah, is that... Double of the life I mean, that's a... I mean, come on. That's a, they were trying to kill these animals because they were like, well, let's see how much to toxic dose could these things take before they die. And that that's what opened... So she, she had her athletes on it. And this is a gal, a friend of mine, Lisa, we call her Shazandermeyer from Calgary. She's a athletic trainer and Olympic trainer actually mm -hmm. she trains Olympic athletes and she had one of her guys had beaten a 10-year plateau in rowing and that something about that alert I was like whoa you don't beat a 10-year plateau in rowing with this stuff and that's what got me into the C60 which is again a fraction of the activated charcoal less than one percent but it is part of what's in activated charcoal so then I started digging in deeper and deeper and deeper, and I kind of fell into this whole thing after taking so much C60. My body started going, you should have activated charcoal regularly. If you're going to take this stuff regularly. Just intuitively? Intuitively. Just, I follow my instincts after 25 years, as you do too, right? It's at this point, you follow your instincts. If your body's telling you, do this, you almost can't go against it. You know, it's like, it's like going against your intuition. Anyway, so I started taking activated charcoal, and after a couple months on both of them, this thought hit me, and just a random thought, I thought, 
I never have looked into activated charcoal and longevity research. And that's when, that's when all heaven broke loose. Tell us more. So what happened was I ended up onto a, a group of researchers, especially the Russian gerontologist Frolkus, who had found that he could extend the lifespan of animals by 20 to 47% with activated charcoal consistently all the time, every, to every case. Which Now, let me tell you how crazy that is. The best food for a human being, according to research on longevity, and consistently extends lifespan is olive oil. And it extends lifespan in humans and animals by 9 to 18% consistently. That's I, number one. I, I just read, um, and then it made me remember that I think I heard it from you first that the Italians say food is an excuse to consume all. <laughs> That's how I've always been. I, you know, I, don't, I grew up, I didn't really, I was more into avocados. You know, I grew up in Southern California. And uh, some years into uh, the olive oil, you know, I didn't really get to the good stuff, you know, until I really became an Epicurean and was really like, wait, olive oil, change, the quality means a lot, just like anything, like wine or anything else. So I got into quality olive oil and I was starting going, whoa, this is an excuse to like, I need to get more of this into my body. This food's an excuse to get this into my body. So I agree with that wisdom. I well, think it's well, real. Just, just real quick, what is quality olive oil? Because I think our listeners want it. Okay, well, one thing is you don't want to, you don't want any olive oil that's cut with anything like cottonseed oil, soybean oil, canola oil, or right. anything else. So you have to search out like a farm that you trust. Mm. Not not just a brand you trust, but a farm that you, you don't trust. know. Because you don't know. Mm. And, and a lot of Italian olive oils today are cut. And when you get it from the farm and it's got that like spicy kind of taste, that's the good stuff? That's the good stuff. How do you tell if it's rancid or if it's just spicy and good? Well, almost all restaurant olive oils, unless they're really quality, are going to be, they're going to have rancid oils in it, like canola oil oh, yeah, it's cause, cause or saffron oil. Real quick. And, they, and, it's, and they'll, so they'll be real thin. They won't have that real olive oil taste. So it'll be like cut like 50%. So, you know, you, I, I notice this in restaurants. You know, if I go to a restaurant and go, whoa, don't touch that olive oil. So the stability of the real olive oil, that saturated fat, that that is what keeps it stable. And yeah, and it'll be fancy. thicker. It'll be a thicker oil. And it's it's actually a monounsaturated fat mostly. Okay. <clears throat> but it has tremendous um, shelf life. Now, olive oil does have tremendous coconut, shelf life. MCTs, it's pure saturated. So It's, it's pure so, saturated, right? So it right. doesn't go rancid like coconuts because it has other stuff mixed in. That's right, yeah. Now, as soon as you start mixing in the, the safflower oil, the canola oil, the, the soy oil, those are polyunsaturates. So that means that they have more susceptibility to oxidation. PUFAs. PUFAs. Polyunsaturated fatty fats. Fatty acids. In your chips, in everything. And, and what happens Crazy. when that stuff goes in your body and gets to... You know, your, your it, temperature. it interferes with your cell membranes and also your brain and your eyes and all the oily tissues of your body. So our brain of our cell is actually the membrane. It's the actual outer skin. And it, there's some, to some degree, that's also true of our skin, right? Our skin and our brain is all formed out of the same material. Udo Ra mm -hmm. Rasmus. Udo fat, Rasmus. Fats yeah. that heal, fats that kill. And uh, he talks about the phospholipid bilayer around the cell that if we are not giving it the right good fats, mm -hmm. like our in chocolate, then you know it starts to uh, it starts to mess with us, and that's why our skin. I I heard that the polyunsaturated fats go under the skin, and if we have a little age spot, it's actually indicative of underneath the skin. It's oxidized so much, mostly because of these bad fats we're taking in. That's exactly and precisely right. Well said, actually. So that membrane needs to be in integrous. It needs to be healthy and happy and when we have these canola oils, safflower oils, polyunsaturated oils, soy oils, corn oils, it makes those those membranes either too porous or too gooey and so stuff can't get through and that ends up causing omega-3 fatty acid deficiencies, it causes cell membrane problems, it can cause cell mutations, it can lead to diabetes and just goes on and on and on. It's basically cause a syndrome of numerous problems. The, the very reason they think they're taking those fish oils, which are kind of in there with the polyunsaturated fats as far as um, oxidizing our body? Well, the, the fish oil and al I take algae oil, it has to be non-oxidized because those are very susceptible to oxidation right, right. because they are polyunsaturates as well. So they have many angles where oxygen can get at them. Now, if we're taking that, you know, we're trying to get that to displace the canola oil and to displace right. the corn oil and soy oil, it's just like... 
just don't eat the soy oil, corn oil, safflower oil, canola oil. That's your best bet is to just stay away from that stuff. And by the way, it slips in, as we're talking about, in olive oil. It slips in. So that's something you've got to be aware of. So quality olive oil, you've got to go after, like I like Acropolis olive oil out of the north of Crete in Greece. I know the farm, I know the farmers, I know the family. I know where it's coming from. I love you know the, everything about them. I like Rallis olive oil out of the Peloponnesus of Greece. I know the family. You got some Greek in you? I'm, I, I'm sure I have some ancient Greek in me, yeah, for we, sure. Yeah, we've had lifetimes there. I've been yeah. Greek yeah, before. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, you could tell just by, you know, years when I was a kid and we were reading the Iliad in seventh grade. Oh, yeah. And I remember looking at the Lattimore translation, and uh, and there on the cover was you know one of the ancient Greek statues or something like that. I kept looking at that, kept thinking I've never seen there's people that like look like that anymore. Mm. And so I said to my my teacher one day, Mr. Born, Born Traeger, I remember him, and I said, Who looks like that? And he said, You look like that. Oh, and yeah. at that moment, I got the whole download. Wow. Right at that moment, wow. seventh grade, you know, like I believe in past lives. You know, yeah, and, and our audience, of course, is tuned in with that. And I mean, any psychic reading I've had, they've always said you've had some, you know, talk about the Greek lifetimes. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we're, we have, uh, I have Polish, Russian, Jewish lineage, and you have Jewish as well. And it's like, that's our physical lineage. But then uh, our spiritual lineage goes back, I know, for me, from the, the Greek, but also India, the Essenes, we were mm -hmm. probably there. Yeah, we're sure, I'm sure we were there. You and I together. We were scenes in a past life. We we're, were definitely Greeks in a past life. And uh, and when I read the the works of the Greeks, I feel like that was my race of people, mm. right? They like it's like whoa, that's my those are my people. That's that's how I feel about it. So that's the thing about this world is that when you do have even some of these foods like olive oil, you know, olive oil is genetically mm. for Mediterranean peoples like us. Yeah, yeah. You know that we're not only like physically like a lot of our genetics come from that region, but spiritually we come from that place so it's not like eat to your blood type anymore it's like eat to your your soul type your soul type <laughs> yeah like that yeah so back to the carbon okay so it, it, anyway with the with the carbon what ended up happening is i started getting into it as a regular thing i started looking at the research by focus and i started going geez this is unbelievable who, who knew for many many years we thought that charcoal absorbed healthy nutrients Charcoal does not absorb healthy nutrients. There's no evidence of that. There's never been any evidence of that. It adsorbs toxic substances. It adsorbs the most toxic substances in our environment, like glyphosate, mm. mercury, lead, you name it. I mean, just let's go down, like, you name whatever, whatever it is, whatever drug people are on, it absorbs it. It adsorbs it, not ab. It's with a D. And that's, there's a difference there. Like, uh, like diatomaceous earth adsorbs, doesn't it? Good question. Diatomaceous earth is an excellent detoxification substance, but it's because it's crushed up pieces of silicates, it's yeah. crushed up glass. For a human being, it's a little being, harsh. A little harsh. Not, not that it's harsh for every human being. Some human beings' digestive systems are tougher. But when you look at like a ruminant animal like a cow, I'd have no problem feeding diatomaceous earth to a cow for a couple weeks to get the, the parasites out and mm. stuff like that. But for a human being, it's, it's a little trickier because some people are very sensitive. They have a thinner membrane for their digestive system. We aren't used to eating burnt silica or, or you know eating that. We're used to eating burnt food, though. Right. Back in the day. Yeah, right. Exactly. So it's more like... It, with silica, it's more like an earth material. It's an earthy material. It's like eating sand, kind oh, of, okay. which animals can handle a little bit better than us. Not that we can't handle that. We can, but it's just, it depends on the person. So diatomaceous earth, I would say, that's a good question. I don't know if it ad absorbs or adsorbs. I think the research I did is both ab and adsorbs. And, okay, it's both, yeah. And then zeolite also probably is both. Mm. Um, but there's nothing more robust. There's nothing easier to access. There's nothing that has longer human usage. There's nothing that has more scientific research behind it than activated charcoal. And that's a shocker, it really is. So that got me into it, doing it regularly, which I've been doing for the last five years. Like four or five times a week, or you know, you go to the, you go out, like we were at at OLAC the other day, you know, which is one of our favorite restaurants here. Amazing vegan food and raw food there. And, but you leave there and sometimes you're just like, uh oh, what's gonna happen here? All the combinations. Yeah, all the combinations of stuff. And then boom, you hit the activated charcoal. I hit seven of them the other day and boom, I was fine. I How much so charcoal fine. do you take a day? So I would take, I would recommend for new people, you take 400 milligrams a day. And you have a charcoal product. Yes. And what's it called? Coal biter. 
Where did you get that name from? Okay, so that name comes from the history of charcoal eaters in Scandinavian mythology. And that, that's a neat, that's another thing too. I definitely had some Viking past lives or something right. like that because I, you know, I've, I've been to Iceland. I've been going to Iceland for over it. 20 years. Yeah. And I've had a place in Iceland, you know, off and on for years. It's just my favorite place probably ever other than my, where I live currently in Hawaii and in and, and Canada. So anyway, the coal biter has to do with Scandinavian mythology in that there was always a runt in the litter. You know, there's always a kid in the family, like, you know, you have five kids, you're trying to survive, you're in Iceland, it's freezing cold, you know, this is a five, thousand years ago. And uh, you, you, you're trying to survive and you're, you're, you have one kid in the family, it's like, oh, I can't go outside, it's too cold, it's too freezing, whatever. And that kid would be the kid who would stay home and tend the fire. Because when your your family's out there, you know they're out fishing, they're out hunting, they're out with the animals, they're out farming, they're out in the elements, and it's in the Arctic. You want to make sure that when you get home, you have a nice, warm little home to get into. And they actually put their homes into the earth. They, they had a really the cool fire system. is right there, there. It's right in the middle of the whole thing, and they had their animals living downstairs, and they'd be upstairs because the heat would rise wow. from the animals, and it was a neat system. Yeah, that's but cool. but that home fire was key because without that, you're freezing in in that environment. And the coal biter, or the kid who would be the runt of the litter from, like, say, age seven and could, With the K, could manage coal it. coal biter. Coal biter, yeah. K-O-H-L-B-I-T-R. That's the Icelandic spelling. Coal biter. Coal biter. Coal biter. They, they would manage the fire and then nibble on the piece of charcoal, birch or willow charcoal in this case, oh. at the edges of the fire throughout their, from seven years old, eight years old, nine years old, ten years old, until they were about 14. And then by the time they were 14, that child would go through a startling metamorphosis and would become the most capable, the most resilient, the toughest, the most with the most capability of being out there late hunting, farming, fishing, whatever had to be done to survive. And that transformational being was called the coal biter. And that had been ingrained into the Scandinavian mythology, into the Icelandic sagas. It's in there. In fact, J.R.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis, who had their, their club in Oxford, they named their club the coal biters. As a, really? Yeah, as a, a K-O-H-L-B-I-T-R, as a symbol of transformation. So this is something wow. well known. That wasn't in the movie. Right? <laughs> And so it's just such an interesting thing. I started getting it. It's going, whoa, people know. An Icelandic guy gave me the tip on this. Really? He's like, wait, you, you know about the coal biters and the sagas? And I was like, no. I was in a sauna in Reykjavik. And I was like, no. What are, what are you talking about? He's like, oh, get the sagas. Get Check this out. Look at this. And sure enough, there it is. Amazing. Well, uh, we'll be sure to uh, get, get you guys biting some coal. <laughs> so, uh, look, you know, all of your journeys all over the world, I mean, you, you come across some really interesting people and uh, i think one of the most interesting people i definitely want to share with these guys is yuri geller oh interesting can, can you just share a little bit of your spoon bending experience with yuri geller because uh and maybe give a little background on him oh fantastic okay yuri geller you may know him as the spoon bender from I, I first became aware of him in 1975 probably through some of the television programs that we were watching that showed his amazing psych psychokinetic abilities i think is when you can bend objects with your mind or move objects with your mind and uh, and just all those you, you know of course you get the people say it's all hoax it's a magic trick but something as a kid i was like no this is legit this is real i need to research this so eventually i tracked down the um geez i, I tracked down the books i think that was where it started and i got into yuri geller's books that were at eden hot springs this is about 20 years ago and I thought, okay, I'm going to get into this. And, and then one night, so I was, got really into reading his stuff and all, you know, what he was about in his history. And Andrea Puharich, who studied him intensively, and Andrea Puharich was an amazing, famous scientist and researcher who invented the, what was the, the cage, the Faraday cage. Oh, wow. Right. That was Andrea Puharich. Right. So anyway, one night I'm reading his, in his book, and he says, he says, sometimes when people are watching me on TV or they're listening to me talk, or they're even reading the words that I've written, they will sometimes take on the abilities that I have and metal will bend right in front of them wherever they are in the world. At that exact moment, a, a trap in the other room goes off, like a big rat trap that I had. I was like, oh good, I got that rat. 
right? And I go out there the next day and the, the mechanism was bent and there was no rat in there. And I was like, oh, come on, this can't, can't be, what? Wow, I didn't know that. So that was, that was one of those things that got me really thinking and I was like, this is, this is interesting. Anyway, so as I got deeper into it, I started realizing that it's real, it's been real. I mean, Yuri Geller has, has under controlled scientific conditions, guessed three digit numbers out of people's minds, a hundred people in a row correct under controlled scientific conditions, which means that like you're in a line with 100 other people, you have a three digit number in your mind, you have it written down on a piece of paper, it's in your pocket, he goes 323, boom, you pull out it out, it's 323, next person, next person comes up, he says 121, boom, per person pulls out 121, next person comes up, 997, boom, it's accurate, 100 times in a row. Mm. Very scientifically documented as well. I mean. That's the thing. See, we don't really live in a scientific world. We live in a scientismic world oh. where if the science doesn't go the direction that they want it to with the materialism and the materialist outcome, they go, uh, we're just going to get rid of this. And, and that, that's what I love Charles Fort. Charles Fort's my favorite author of all time. And he said he called that that the, the damned information, the excluded information. Right. Oh, it didn't fit our scientific paradigm. We better get rid of the evidence then. Instead of changing the theory, we get rid of the evidence. Right, that's right. that's more of what our world is, and we call yeah. that scientism versus science. Scientism, yeah, yeah. Because, you know, uh, let me tell you what happened when I finally got to Yuri Geller's house. So, you know, we'd been in touch, and eventually got in touch with him, and and uh, I was like, I'd love to come meet you. And so he's like, next time you're in Heathrow, come come out to my house. So this, he was living outside of London. He lives in Tel Aviv now, but he was living outside of uh, London in, near Heathrow Airport. So I went over his house. And I'm um, hanging out with him, and I gave him all my books. He gave me all his books. We're just having a wonderful time. He's been a vegetarian since 1970. I've been a vegetarian 31 years. He's been a vegetarian for 50 years. Wow. That's pretty epic. That is. And so, you know, he just has this wonderful energy about him and incredible, you know, there's phenomenon going on around him, you know, especially like we're tuned into that kind of still. thing. We're open to it. Still, absolutely still. Yeah. Which is all now. And so. According to the beings that, uh, that that he works with, because that's that that's a a different part of the story. Because he he says that he is uh, connected, and and you guys will appreciate this. Uh, he's connected with a some type of extraterrestrial craft or beings. That um, he said it's not him that does these things; it's uh, it's them, and they're kind of just working through him. That's what I've noticed with the great psychics in the world that I've met, because I've sought them out, like Yuri Geller, my friend Howard Wills, and, and people like that. It's not so much that they really are controlling the psychic phenomenon; they're just trying to manage it. It's something that's working through them, and they're just trying to manage it. It's not that they're like. It's not what we think it is. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So, so what happened at his house? Okay, so we're at his house, and, and uh, I said, Yuri, you know, I know you've done those three-digit numbers out of people's minds, and you want to do something like that? And he's like, yeah, we could do that, or why don't we do this? Because, you know, I, I think it would be more fun. Why don't you draw a picture, uh -huh. and then, and you, of course, don't show me, and then I'll draw it, and, and we'll match them up and see what happens. <laughs> I was like, okay, that sounds like fun. So, you know, a Western mind, I'm, you know, I'm all, you know, screwed up from scientism myself. I'm like, he's got cameras, whatever. I'm, I'm, I can't even see what I'm drawing. <laughs> you know, I've got my hand over the thing. I've got a book cover over the thing. I'm drawing a picture. He goes in the other room, hang out with his, uh, his brother-in-law. And when he comes back in, he says, okay, you, you ready? I was like, yeah. And he's like, okay, I want you to imagine with your, you know, with your um, mind what you drew. And uh, of course, you know, don't show me what you drew and I'll draw it. And I was like, okay, that sounds good. And I remember looking at him, and, and I just remember something strange about his left eye. You know, just looking at him was like, just something struck me about his left eye that stuck, stayed in my memory. Mm. And he, he, he draws something, and he goes, let me see what you drew. And he, without even looking at it, without even, he, he just holds both images up to the light like that, up to the window, and it was a carbon copy, exact, <sighs> exact. Even if you could see what I drew, there's no way. He didn't even look. He knew it was exact. Wow. He didn't even have to. He didn't have to look. And I was like, whoa. You know, that's one of those things where you just go, you know, I get chills even thinking about it now. But it's, it goes beyond that. Because, you know, I told that story for years and people are like, it's, come on, this is BS. You know, of course, scientism, right? We're all super materialistically minded. So eventually I was like, okay, you know what? I'm going to take a picture of this particular, you know, pic of what I drew and what he drew. And I'm going to put that up in my presentation. So if somebody says it's BS, I'll go, there's the picture. You tell me, right? So it was interesting because 
what I had that picture, when I took that picture, it was stored in the back of one of his books, which is in my office. And so I opened that up and I took the picture of the two images, you know, digital picture. And you know, there's that sleeve that comes around the back of the book and it usually has the author's picture on it. Yeah. So one day I'm showing that image and I realized that there's a page that had, it was exactly splitting his face in half. So only his left eye was showing <laughs> in the image. So I've been, I've been showing that for a while. Then one day I looked at it and I went, whoa, that's a trip. And you were getting that download right at that moment. At that moment, right? But it, I didn't catch the it for me. The significance came through. It uh, went yeah. through. Because the psychic phenomenon follows you through time and it's not, maybe even not, settled precisely in time or something like that it's you know that's I like studying that stuff because it shows us where the gaps are in our knowledge and it shows us where we're looking the other way because we go oh that can't exist I better look the other way and instead of like hey that can't exist maybe it does exist because there I'm seeing it I'm observing it we're recording it this is scientifically validated maybe there's stuff we don't understand about our reality and we have to change our worldview you imagine think? that I mean geez right <laughs> Read the book by Yuri Geller. I don't know what the main book is called, but uh, he's got some great ones. I mean, um, I just remember Yuri Geller, and uh, it's, it has all the experiments in there. Um, at the end of the book, well, I, I won't, I won't uh, ruin it for you, but he starts communicating th with these extraterrestrials through um, tapes. Yes, and messages would come through. They'd play the tape, and then they would go to replay the tape and be erased, and they they come through in this like robotic voice they're like do you get it we are you from the future trying to get us to not make those same kind of mistakes of, of going down the path of ai and transhumanism they're like don't forget your humanity they they are us way in the future who have have lost their humanity they've come back to work through people like him to to help us recognize what we got because they want that now that might be what some of the genetic experiments are about to try to regain that uh you know on this future present now timeline so it's really fascinating and uh, thanks for sharing that. that was yeah thanks that i love getting into that kind of stuff it's really fun you know this is where the real action is in research which is the edge of our perception and that's kind of what's happening in food too. It's like what we're bringing you to that, you know, this, like look at the chocolate revolution that's going on right here, bro. Right, it's like th this is a whole new perception of what chocolate is. It's a whole new concept of what chocolate really is about, which is a delivery system for all these wonderful herbs like macuna and all the, you know, by the way, macuna as an anti-stimulant, let's finish that story off, is really important for conditions like Parkinson's, mm. right? So when somebody has a shaking disorder, they've basically been stimulated too much. Mm. So the anti-stimulation from Makuna immediately normalizes that, and that's the most effective medication, it's really an herb, against Parkinson's ever discovered. And you, if you're, by the way, if you're dealing with Parkinson's or someone you know has Parkinson's, you want to look for a Makuna extract that's standardized to 15% L-DOPA, and that's the one you want to take. Thank you.